my days are short. As I grow weaker, I experience so much gratitude for my meditation. Not only the joy and ease it brought, but also the hard parts. For every pain and ache I sat through, and every itch I witnessed and did not scratch, and every fearful fantasy that came to my mind and I didn't approach was a training for kindness, a training for the muscles, for bearing witness for the trusting spirit that carries me now, even as I face my death. Tomorrow Angle, prominent meditation teacher and writer, passed away not too long ago from her cancer, healed but not cured. It was the loss, Maureen said. The cancer took away so much, more than just my chest, but my heart. Maureen, a cancer survivor who was diagnosed with breast cancer, endured years of intensive radiation therapy and finally a double mastectomy, which took her chest away and along with it, her cancer. Maureen was cured but she wasn't healed. Today, I would like to talk about how the practice of meditation can teach a patient who is cured how to begin the process of healing and even teach a patient who is considered as incurable how to begin to heal even when facing their death. But before I talk to you about uh, how I use meditation to heal patients at Albert Einstein Medical School, we first must understand what it means to heal and what it means to cure. See, these two terms are somewhat confusing to medical practitioners, healthcare professionals, and even patients that really don't know how to differentiate the two. Curing is very different than healing. Curing is typically the act of solely ridding the body of an illness or a disease, whether it be a bladder infection cured with an antibiotic in three days, and a fracture in the arm that can be cast and cured in two months, or a basal cell carcinoma can, that can be lopped off and never return again. Healing is different. Healing is what I would like to call a holistic practice that considers the well being of a patient's mind their psychology, emotions, and behaviors. Healing is also a natural practice, a practice that is within the power and possibility innately within each and every one of us here and elsewhere to practice and to nurture. Lisa Rankin, MD, talks a little bit about her medical training. See, in medical school and residency, most of our training focused on curing, very little attention was focused on healing. You might heal a fracture or even heal a gaping wound, but healing a person? Nah, nah, woo woo, hocus pocus, horseshit. The mind of a cancer patient can be quite confusing and difficult to approach by a clinician when a cure is in their mind. See, disorders and conditions such as chronic stress, depression, and post-traumatic anxiety can visit a cancer patient before, during, and even after their cancer journey. But these conditions and disorders, which are most of the time considered as incurable or difficult to cure, should not stop an oncologist's hope or a patient's desire that a healing can now take place. See, treatments of these conditions typically and predominantly include the administration of powerful psychopharmacological drugs, which can only temporarily alleviate present states of destructive behavior. But when used alone, these drugs might be very imperative for alleviating behavior or curing behavior that may even be suicidal in a patient. But they can't be used to endure a treatment that can permanently change the brain and neural architecture of a patient and teach them how to start living psychologically 
with a disease or a condition such as cancer. Meditation is the practice which can offer this long-term treatment because it can take which was once thought as incurable and turn it into something that is now healable. See, when I was invited to the University of Wisconsin-Madison to partake in neuroscience research on meditation, I became quite fascinated and it became very clear to me that meditation is able to, to produce permanent changes in the brain of a patient. Meditation is a science of the mind. At the lab in Wisconsin, I was working with toddlers in cultivating empathetic behavior and compassion with meditation. I was even working with Marines who came back from Afghanistan after long years of fighting, but who were diagnosed now with PTSD and were trying to find a way how to balance their emotions and find equanimity now in their life. And I was even working with Tibetan meditators, these guys who've slotted in over 50,000 hours of meditation in their life. And when scanning them with that interesting machine you see right there called an EEG, scientists and myself included were seeing how they were actually modulating and growing places in their brain that are associated with compassion, empathy, sense of self, and sense of psychological renewal. Neuroplasticity is a scientific phenomenon on which meditation is based. Neuroplasticity is the finding that the brain is an, an adaptable organ. It's very unique in this way that the brain can actually change and be shaped by human experience and our environment. So many people say that you are what you eat, right? But in terms of neuroplastic neuroplasticity, it's more like you are what you attend to, what you concentrate on, what you adhere to, what you train the brain to see. As you can see here, I endured um, this practice as well. Um, and this is what this clip was taken from a documentary called When the Iron Bird Flies. And I was meditating, and they were reading um, the electrical signals that were coming off my brain uh, during the meditation session. Meditation can cultivate a healing dialogue between the brain and the body. This dialogue is bi directional, and it's not only localized in the brain. It, meditation has an effect on our peripheral biology, our biology, biology below the neck. And when I came out of the lab at the University of Wisconsin and came back to Sarah Lawrence as a pre-medical student, I decided to do something clinical. Due to the fact that meditation can induce such healthful effects on the body, I went to Albert Einstein Medical School here close by in the Bronx and uh, approached radiation oncologists with a new idea to develop a free meditation program that can teach meditation to cancer patients suffering from depression, stress, and anxiety. This program, which I teach every week throughout the week, is taught to multiple races, multiple ethnicities, and people that come in with multiple beliefs because cancer doesn't choose who it attacks. And so the program prevents me with many challenges. And each and every one of these challenges turns very quickly into a blessing. See, a lot of people think that meditation is all about this. Right, this is a beautiful sound that emanates in the lofty halls of a fancy downtown Manhattan meditation center. <laughs> right, but that's not how my meditations sound like. My meditations sound a bit like this. 
Now this is a recording taken from one of the hallways at the center in which I teach meditation. And so I tell my patients not to concentrate on the on the on the beach in Bali, you know, being being healthy again, being younger again with their favorite drink in their hand and and escaping the moment. It's actually about teaching the patient how to adhere to the reality of their moment. The reality of a body that is weak, a reality that a body has cancer, and that meditation is not about es escaping, but arriving. So meditation can be put into the house that gives them stress. Meditation can be taught three doors, da doors down from a treatment center that radiates them. The possibility for me to be cured is unlikely. The doctor said that the cancer has reached both lungs and surgery for the moment would just be too complicated. But honey, I think I'm ready to heal. Sarah is a patient that I've become quite close to both as a friend and as a teacher. Sarah was too diagnosed with breast cancer and she felt the moment quite confusing and disturbing to realize. But as I teach Sarah meditation, a healing transformation can now begin. As I guide Sarah, she learns to how to remain present with her fears. Many times patients are fearful of the future. They can't expect what will come. They might leave their children motherless, fatherless. Sarah then lets go during the meditation of her judgment, the constant desire to edit, to change, to label, to monitor, to push away. So many times these sens sensorial um, sensations and feelings come up into a patient and they don't know how to deal with them. So they decide to see the pain and run the other way or they take it and they just close it up and put a barrier around it. So she locates the place that asks for her healing. Not the healing of a doctor, not the healing of a caretaker, but she brings upon it to herself to ask for her power and her power alone. And she lets it unfold and allows it to be. See, pain moves. Pain's confusing. It's choppy like a stormy sea. And so if she can let it be choppy, she can realize how complicated it is to be ill. And when she realizes this, in gratitude, she can give her body and mind the permission to heal. Unbearable pain becomes its own cure. Travel far enough into sorrow, tears turn to sighing. This, is, this was written by Ghalib, who was a 19th century Persian poet. I tell my patients that healing is not a fight or a battle. Healing is about attending to that which is ill itself. It's about placing a life-affirming attention onto that which is weak and that which was used to be judged and edited away. See, I tell them that the best boxers have either taken dance lessons or they just look like they have. So meditation is not about a fighting, but it's about a dance. It's about a dance of awareness, concentration, and peace. So the moment, which was once quite disturbing, can be transformed during a meditation. See, the sensations of inadequacy, fear, sorrow, and self-judgment can be transformed and evolved into awareness, concentration, and peace. Here's the chance for a mindful medicine to develop. A practice like meditation can be taught in hospitals, cancer treatment centers, to doctors, caretakers, 
healthcare professionals, and even patients. It can teach patients who are cured how to begin to heal. And it can teach patients who are considered as incurable how to face a death because death and healing aren't mutually exclusive. Medica meditation can transform that which was once judged into something that now can be acknowledged. I believe that meditation can pioneer medicine on its track of alternative to complementary to integrative. I believe that meditation can place the mind back into medicine. And this medicine can now start to heal. Thank you very much.